Hi, my name is Tay Keller, and I am the author of The Science of Breakable Things, When You Trap a Tiger, and now Jennifer Chan is not alone. This is a book about friendship and bullying. It is a book about searching for aliens, and it is a book about asking really big questions. Questions about what else is out there? Are we alone in the universe? Do aliens actually exist? And questions about what is in here. What does it mean to hurt somebody? What does it mean to help somebody? What does it mean to be a good person? And how do we be the best version of ourselves? So that is Jennifer Chan is not alone in a nutshell. And I will be reading from the first chapter. Chapter one, now. The end of everything starts with a buzz. You know the one. The insecty buzz that makes your heart beat faster, that tells you somebody wants your attention. So maybe I should say, the end of everything starts with a text. But we'll get to that in a minute. Because right now I'm here, sitting with Tess and Reagan in our school's chapel, my thigh sweat slipping against the wooden seat, shirt sticking to my back. The overhead fans are spinning, but they're not nearly enough for the small town Florida heat, even in October. Reagan fans herself with a concert program and mine falling asleep. She even lets out a quiet fake snore. Tess muffles her laugh and I make wide eyes at them. Eyes that say, pay attention or we'll get in trouble. But also, you are so right. I'm bored out of my mind. I can say a lot without saying a word, which comes in handy during these evening orchestra concerts. And let's be honest, Reagan can be a bit dramatic, but she's not entirely wrong. We come to these concerts because Tess's sister is in the orchestra and we can't make Tess attend alone. But the problem with Gibbons Academy Middle School Orchestra is that rather than learning new music, they play the same Christmas carols all year, every year. By the millionth rendition of Silent Night, it's kind of a lot. Secretly though, I think there's something comforting about the strings and the familiarity. And today, especially, I welcome the sameness. Today, I'm locked in a battle with my brain, thinking about the incident from Friday while also really not thinking about it. My mind keeps drifting, floating to that feeling of my whole self coming apart. And then I have to drag my thoughts back, right back to this very normal, very boring evening. See, silent night, just like it always is. And that's when Reagan's phone buzzes, the text that ends everything. But I don't know yet that it's an end everything text. The orchestra begins, hark the herald angels sing, and I watch Reagan pull her phone out of her pocket. For a split second, she frowns at the name on her screen. Then she rearranges her face, like she realized her reaction was wrong. She smiles and raises her brows until they disappear beneath her dark brown bangs. Her blue eyes spark. These are the kind of eyes that say, I have a secret. It's Pete, she mouths. With a rush of relief, I send a thank you up to the universe. This is the perfect distraction. Unlike the incident, Reagan's drama with Pete is predictable and constant. It's as familiar as a Christmas carol. Seriously? Tess whispers too loudly. From the pew in front of us, a random dad shushes her, and Reagan rolls her eyes before dropping her gaze to Pete's text. As she reads, her shoulders stiffen. She doesn't say anything. She doesn't move. But her eyes flick back and forth over the screen like she's reading the text again and again. I try to look over her shoulder, but she tilts the screen away from me. Too late, I realize my mistake. That tiny movement, that flick of a hidden screen, signals to test that this might be a particularly interesting flavor of gossip. And now she'll never, never let it go. What's it say? She asks. Like, you have to tell us? Something to know about Tess. Every sentence that leaves her mouth is a question. 
Even when she's making a statement, she ends it with a question mark. She leans over me to get closer to Reagan, and I try to nudge her away. Tess is all long legs, long arms, tall and thin and sharp. Right now, her elbow digs into my stomach, and her red-orange curls stick to my lip gloss. Tess, I say, stop. I'm distracted, so it takes a moment to notice Reagan's reaction. She sucks on her lips, and her skin goes so pale that the freckles sprinkled across her cheeks look like bright, bold specks of paint. This is an expression I've only seen once before. One time, in over a year of best friendship. Reagan is scared. My heartbeat leaps into my ears, and I tell it to stop being so dramatic. Maybe you should put the phone away, I tell Reagan. I can't deny that I'm curious, but after last week, I'm not in the mood for anything intense. Um, definitely don't put the phone away, Tess says, because you have to tell us what's going on. The dad turns to shush, shush us for a second time, but Reagan ignores everyone. She taps back and forth and back and forth with Pete until she finally looks up. There are police cars at Jennifer's house, she whispers. Definitely not normal. No, I say. At least I think I say it, because I hear myself speak, but I don't actually register saying the word. I grasp for reasonable explanations. Do you think the police were just stopping by? Or maybe do you think Jennifer told the police what we did? Tess interrupts. Like, are they coming for us? I wish Tess would give this a minute. I wish she would wait one second before jumping to conclusions. I can't process. My right leg starts shaking and my heart beats so loud I can't even... But no, no, this doesn't make sense. We can't go to jail for the incident. I mean, it wasn't great. It's not my favorite thing to think about. But it wasn't that bad. It wasn't illegal. Don't be stupid, Reagan says, and I can't help but flinch at the way she says the word, her consonants hard and harsh. Stupid. The police aren't there for us. So what's Tess starts, but Reagan's phone buzzes again. She stares at the screen and she whispers to us, Pete's not supposed to know this, but he heard it from his dad. Pete's dad is the county sheriff, so Pete's always finding out more than he should know. Reagan swallows. Jennifer's missing. I let the words settle over me, thick and icy. The heat and humidity can't touch me anymore. She's missing, I repeat. I try to make sense of this, but it's all so weird. Nothing ever happens in this town. Nothing ever happens in Nowhereville. Reagan looks at me, and beneath the stone in her expression, there's a desperation only I can see. Her eyes say, I need you. Jennifer left a note that says she's like running away. She ran away. I'm only capable of repeating Reagan's words, apparently. Leaning over, Tess asks, did she say why? Reagan blinks, like she forgot Tess was there, but I have to admit, I'm glad Tess asked the question. I need to know too. Reagan shakes her head. Not sure. Pete's dad wouldn't show him the note. Maybe it's not fair, but suddenly I am red hot mad at Pete. I hate Pete, seriously. Why would he tell Reagan something like this if he didn't know the whole story? Why would he tell her without that crucial bit of information? Oh my gosh, Tess says. Do you think this is like Jennifer's revenge? The thought makes me woozy. Like, do you think Jennifer's trying to get back at us? Tess pushes. Trying to get us in trouble? Her questions bulldoze any last shred of calm, any scrap of normalcy. I feel like my intestines are disintegrating. The energy in the chapel shifts and I notice the whispers. It's almost like Jennifer's news is a physical thing. 
I can see it moving through the chapel. We find out first. Then Kyle, Pete's best friend, checks his phone and whispers to one of his friends. Kyle texts someone and then his girlfriend of two days gets a ping and gasps and then all the sports girls are whispering. I watch the news ripple through the students. Not all of us are here this evening, but enough. Before the end of the night, nearly everyone will know. The news moves in waves of popularity through the pews, with some kids turning back to Reagan and me, almost like they want to know how to act. Under their gaze, I feel itchy, shaky, like I have no control of my body. Too quickly, the news reaches the parents and they murmur amongst themselves. News spreads fast in Nowhereville. That is something to know. I hear her name, whispered softly at first, then loudly. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. She's impossible to escape. She's everywhere. She's not here. A parent runs up and says something to the conductor who cuts the music. Phones ring, people talk, the whole world is too loud. And I hear it over and over. Jennifer Chan ran away. Jennifer Chan is missing. The end of everything starts quietly with a buzz you can barely hear, but it doesn't end that way. Not even close.